Michael Sheen is a legendary British actor, and I want to talk to him about a few things. Firstly, why is acting so dominated by people from such privileged backgrounds? But also, Michael Sheen has a lot to say on what's going on in modern Britain. He's very proud of his Welsh identity. He grew up in Port Talbot, a place at the absolute epicentre of deindustrialisation and all the rest. So what is his take on what is happening in Britain? Why is it that acting is so dominated by people from rich backgrounds? Uh, well, there's a number of reasons. I mean, over time, as drama departments get cut, you know, it becomes a, a, an extracurricular activity. If there's not the money there to, to put on a school production, then it doesn't happen. Youth drama groups that aren't being supported don't have the money, then that's not happening. So th there's that aspect of it, getting children into it in the first place. Then to come to drama school is, is expensive. In a way, I think a lot of people think now because of things like X Factor and and uh, you know and, and and sort of talent show, Britain's Got Talent, that kind of stuff, that you can become an overnight yeah. sensation, overnight famous. You know, and for for acting, you can't do it on your own in your bedroom. You have yeah. to be with a group of people. I went to a comprehensive school that had a, a drama department. I did school plays. My drama teacher at school put me forward for the local county youth theatre. I got into the local county youth theatre. Through that, I, there was a pathway into you know finding out about auditioning for drama schools. I got a discretionary grant because I couldn't have afforded to, to go otherwise. And I went to drama school and then had the career that I had. First of all, that my comprehensive school cut the drama department. Um, now the school doesn't even exist at all. <laughs> my county youth theatre lost its funding. Uh, the discretionary grant's not there anymore. My parents were both very supportive of me uh, wanting to go into the arts and that kind of stuff. So I, I had a lot of advantages. When I think about children, young people who don't have those advantages even, um, if the pathway for me mm. is no longer there, then for them, what chances there at all? The, the figures are shocking, you know. 7% of people get privately educated in this country and yet the representations of people who are privately educated across all the top professions is, is mind-boggling. Including, I mean, including the media. But. Uh, absolutely. I mean, just under 80% of the leading editors of mm. newspapers in journalism are, are from private school. It's kind of really shocking when you think about that. When we think about TV, Phil, it's not just the actors, but the whole thing is kind of dominated by people from quite privileged backgrounds. Do you think that's a problem that's not just unjust in terms of the people who are very talented elsewhere who don't make it, but in terms of the sorts of things that are commissioned, the lack of yeah. kind of authentic, accurate, working class characters, dramas and so on. Yeah, well, you have to remember, before the mid-50s, the culture of Britain, as represented in, in certainly in mainstream film, uh, you know, theatre, was very, very weighted towards, you know, it was yeah. the, the time of Noel Coward and Terence Rattigan and, and, and this kind of, you know, anyone for tennis kind of uh, look of things. If you saw or heard working class accents or characters they were usually in the background or like governor and you know the sort of comedy character in the yeah, background or the, or the like servants that, yeah. or whatever it was yeah then suddenly in the mid 50s you get a play like look back in anger john osborne writing it sort of the kitchen sink drama yeah. and it revolutionized not just theater but british culture it was a burst of energy i think in you know during the 60s i think it's far more down to that opening up of of, of regional voices regional stories um much more than the kind of drug culture and pop music popular culture thing i, I think that's what vitalized our country the danger is is that we're going back the other way again. Yeah. Our culture is a, a, a conversation. Mm -hmm. It's a conversation we have with each other. Mm -hmm. And it's about uh, voices and stories coming from all over. You know, opinions that do clash. It has to, there has to be a healthy way to have differing opinions without it just becoming offensive and abusive and you are the worst kind of shitty scum for not agreeing with what I think. That's unhealthy. Yeah. A healthy argument is one where there are different opinions, different voices, and they're able to be aired and, and, and you can be affected by, you know, you telling me that you disagree with me actually changes me in some yeah. way. That's yeah. important. If we lose that, we're just in a one-sided conversation that just goes round and round in circles and everyone misses out, everyone loses because of it. Port Talbot, where you grew up, is a, a, a working class community. Industry was at its very heart, as it mm. was for many communities, but industrial decline, the disappearance of many of the traditional industries, it's taken its toll, hasn't it? Well, this is, this is you know, very much a, a, a pivotal mo moment in, in Port Talbot's history. It's on the coast, 
if you come back off the coast up through the Avon Valley, as it's known, you're going up through communities that grew up around the, the collieries, the pits, the ironworks. You know, you go back to the Industrial Revolution, that part, the South Wales coal field was like the Wild West. You had to survive, you had to be hardy, you had to be resilient. These communities grew incredibly strong because of that over time. Those communities that grew up around those works in the period of deindustrialization, you know, they have been just left. In the miners' strike in 84, 85, you know, that those communities were, were not just collateral necessarily, but actually the danger was that after the, the Heath government was essentially brought down by, by the NUM in 74, that there was a, an out and out decision that this must not be allowed to happen. And therefore they had to be defeated. There taught was, a lesson. Yeah, taught a lesson that Thatcher was, this, is, this cannot stand. We have to change this country so that this, this can never happen again. The defeat of the miners, the defeat of the trade unions, led to the total abandonment of those communities. You know, I was in uh, Astrid Gunlice yesterday. I'm talking to, you know, some of the older, the older men there who are working on the council, and they're saying, you know, Michael, there is, there's nothing, there's nothing here. There's no jobs. Mm. And we're an aging community. The young people have had to go. Mm. And, you know, there's just nothing to, to keep people here. When people say, well, you should just go, you should just leave. If the work's not there, go and find the work. You know, get on your bike, as Tebbit used to say. You know, there's, there are different ways of dying. And for some people to leave where you live, mm -hmm when you fought so hard and gone through so much in those communities, mm -hmm. to leave it would be to die in a, in a particular way. With Port Albert, you know, Port Albert still has a steel industry there. It's still you know, a major employer, with not just the, the works, but also the supply chain around. Mm -hmm. When the stories came out originally that Tata were going to uh, make, first of all, you know, make a lot of people redundant and then pull out altogether from their UK operations, the stories were that it was losing a million pounds a day and this kind of thing. Now that was hard for the pride of the, the workforce there, the men there. And, uh, and they turned that around. They worked so hard to, to try and get that place back into profit and they managed it. Mm. You know, at this point, whilst the, the steelworks is still there, there's still hope and people are working really hard to try and keep it going. But if it's in the face of, of a totally disinterested uh, an unsupportive government, then there's going to be big problems for the community. And especially if, as has happened across all those old mining communities, if there is no support there, if there's no plan B to help those communities, then it becomes very scary. We grew up voted to leave the European Union. Heavily so, in fact. Mm. Why do you think that was? You know, it can't be a coincidence that in a lot of the communities, not just in Wales, but throughout, you know, Britain, that have had the, the greatest loss yeah. through deindustrialization and have, I think, felt the loss the hardest about globalization, about manufacturing jobs going elsewhere. These are communities that were sort of centered around those kind of manufacturing jobs and heavy industry. Um, it's those communities that seem to have voted most to leave. Um, and they're the communities, obviously, that have also received the most EU money. So obviously there's a huge irony there. There's also a huge irony in the fact that a lot of the people voting to leave were voting along with the, the right-wing Tories who were part of the defeat of those communities after, you know, during the miners' strike. That was a kind of tragic irony as well. But if you can kind of look past the ideology, look past all that and kind of go, what? What was most resonant? I think the most resonant thing for a lot of the people that I've talked to in the different communities was that take back control. It's a very powerful message, take back control, regardless of whether it's about take back control from the EU, or, but that sense of ownership, mm. of control of your community. These are communities that have lost all sense of control. Absolutely. These were the most cohesive, cooperative, you know, the solidarity of those communities. There was nothing like it. Mm. Nowhere else, you know, in, in, certainly in Britain, those mining communities, that yearning, for a sense of community, of belonging, of something that is bigger than yourself, something where you do find strength through togetherness. I think that, that, was, that was what made that you know, take back control a uh, very powerful message, I think, for those communities. And if you feel like your voice isn't being heard, if you feel like you've been abandoned, then to, to have some way to hit out against that, um, I think that was, that, was a bit, that was a big part of what, what the vote was, I think. The only way that we can have a future in those communities is to somehow get back that sense of mm. ownership and that sense of control. I don't necessarily think that's to do with uh, leaving the EU or not leaving the EU. I think it's more about communities being able to take ownership through things like cooperatives, like credit unions, like community share schemes. So that's what I'm focusing on at the moment is looking for what, how, can we how can we get a community to, to help itself?
mm-hmm. you know, to stand on its own two feet. And I think what, what can be true of Patel, but could potentially be true of the whole of Wales. Mm. The other issue, of course, in the referendum, as you say, was immigration. Mm. Now, where I grew up in Stockport, that part of Stockport voted to, to leave. Very few immigrants where I grew up. Mm. It's also the same way you grew up. Why do you think that is? Well, I, I don't know, is the, is the simple answer. I can theorize about it, but you know, ultimately I don't know. I do think there is a sense that someone, somewhere, has messed our community <laughs> up. Yeah. Globalization was supposed to be the tide that rose, that, that makes all ships rise, mm. you know. And uh, unfortunately, the water that allows them to rise is coming from somewhere. Mm. And the water has drained out of a lot of other communities. The idea of, you know, free movement of trade, free movement of people. Um, and I think it's, it's a strong, it's become very connected in yeah. people's minds, I think. And so regardless of whether your town, like Port Albert, which doesn't have a immigration problem in terms of people coming into the town, but I think there's a sense of there are people from other countries who are doing jobs that mm. we used to do and look at what that's done to us. Um, I mean, that's the only thing I can think of really, because like you say, it's, it's not a case of towns being overrun with, with people from other countries. Straddling the Atlantic as you do. Um, in the United States, we've seen the rise, of course, of, of Trump. I mean, do you see a parallel there between what's happened here in Donald Trump and Trumpism? Oh, absolutely. Absolute parallel. I think, in a way, the biggest danger that we have is that the personality of Trump gets in the way of what is actually going on. You know, once the figure of Donald Trump has moved off the stage, what he has tapped into is still there. And that's, you know, and I think it, it has been characterized by the man who is, you know, strangely with an orange face and Very orange. a squirrel on his head, has somehow managed to kind of take center stage over it. The things that demagogues and, and dangerous, dangerous leaders tap into are real things. They're not made yeah. up. Nice. They're just channeled in a particular way that becomes very dangerous for it. You know, there was a lot of similar messaging going on with Trump and with, uh, uh, Bernie Sanders, you know, on the other side, on the left, there was a lot of, you know, appealing to the, the, the forces of globalization, people who have lost out because of manufacturing going elsewhere, um, workers' rights, you know, pay, all kinds of things that people are very scared about and very concerned about. So I think, in a way, Trump is a kind of a distraction mm-hmm. um, for the very real thing that's going on. And I also think that there is, you know, there is a lot to be learned by the left in this country about this. There is clearly a disconnect between the Labour Party and the people who they have represented for generations upon generations now. There is a gap and that gap is being filled by people like UKIP in this country, Trump, you know, and the, and the far right, the, the sort of Tea Party, uh, Breitbart lot in, in America. If a party like UKIP, which is a bunch of numpties, who, you know, just horrendous, if they can pick up so many votes, it shows that you know, people, oh my God, people are clearly, desperately just want someone mm. to, to, to be the face of, of, of what they're feeling, even if it's bloody UKIP or Trump in America, mm. you know. So I think it's so important that, that the left gets his act together. Do you think Jeremy Corbyn's failing to do that in places like Port Talbot at the moment? Well, it seems not because people don't want to get behind him, <laughs> you know. Um, I, I really hope that the grassroots kind of movement to, 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 to rally behind these sorts of issues that I think are really important. I really hope it is able to, to, to expand to the point where it can win a general election within a few years. We'll never know unless the Labour Party unites, or we will never know. And that would be the danger. The danger is that you know, the, the group that Corbyn kind of represents, if they never get the chance to, to try and fail possibly, then they'll always think, oh, well, we were, it was rigged, we were, it was stolen from us, it never happened, and that, Fighting will just go on and on and on and on. You know, the one positive thing about maybe, you know, uh, uh, Corbyn actually having a United Party behind him and trying it and failing in the next election, if that were to be the case, is at least Labour Party can then go, right, that didn't work. How are we going to make this work? At least, you know, everyone can move together. You did a speech about the National Health Service last year, Mm. which went viral. Why should we treasure the NHS and how worried are you for its future existence? It's not just the NHS, is it? It's that whole post-war consensus, the Attlee government, what they brought in, what Nye Bevan was part of creating, but that, the the idea of the safety net, that coming out of the war with a sense of what can be achieved by working together, creating kind of pillars of, of institutions in our country to be a safety net for people. What we have now, are people having to create safety nets around those safety nets. 
And those extra safety nets also have massive holes in them. And, you know, the dismantling of the NHS, the, the attack on the welfare system, these are things that, uh, you know, they do need to be modernised. They do need to be looked at. We can never take it for granted that, that we've got them and they work and that's it. But it was about who we are. Who I think that's why it, it, it connected with a lot of people. About what do we want our values to be? It's important to know how you connect up. You know, the, I was talking about the, wealth, the miners' welfare halls before. Part of what is so... What is so sad for a lot of people in the communities now is saying, you know, a lot of the younger people in our community, they have no idea. Mm. You know, it's just another part of the, of the defeat of those communities. Make sure that you don't know what has gone before you. Don't know what you're a part of, what is at stake. And, and as soon as people lose that connection, that living connection to what's gone before, then of course you just have anger that, that just wants to strike out anywhere, doesn't know where to go. So that it, yeah, the NHS, absolutely, the ethos behind the NHS and what it stands for has to be preserved. It has to be. Um, but it's also part of a wider way of just looking at how we live together, how we work as a, as a society. Tell you what, he's a lot more charismatic than most politicians. Michael Sheen for PM, anyone? What are your thoughts? So please do leave your thoughts as ever. Uh, we've got loads of other interviews up there. Uh, and we've got loads more interviews to come. Always welcome your suggestions. So leave your comments, subscribe. I'll see you next time.